there is this thing called awareness, right? And that was really the underlying, I would say, foundational pillar for doing all these upgrades on the mind, on the body, because with limited awareness, you're not even looking left or right, or right? you're just stuck with your thought activity, not reflecting, and you've literally trapped in your mind. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Burnt Chef Journal, a hospitality-specific podcast dedicated to challenging mental health stigma and conversations designed to inspire a new, healthier, happier, and more sustainable hospitality profession. The Burnt Chef Project is proudly sponsored by Lamb Weston, a leading provider of innovative, high-quality potato products created for chefs to help operators thrive both today and tomorrow. Working carefully with sustainably-minded farmers and growers, Lamb Weston provides potato solutions for every type of kitchen, from premium British chips and fries to potato shapes, wedges, and mash. To find out more, head to lambweston.eu or search your partner in potatoes. So this week's episode, I am incredibly excited to be joined by Dr. Rainer Kraft, who is a seasoned technology leader, engineer, scientist, technical advisor, micronutrients expert, human potential coach and teacher, who shares transformative principles of presence, mind management and biohacking using the latest science of epigenetics. So good morning, Dr. Rainer. How are you? Hey, good. Thanks, Chris, for having me here on the show. No, thank you. Thank you very much. This particular subject matter is of great interest to myself, and I'm sure it'll be of massive interest to our audience as well, especially when it comes down to actually how we get a sort of high-performance mindset and unlimited or unlocking our, our unlimited potential as human beings. So before we get going into the episode, whereabouts in the world are you currently, just out of curiosity? So... Actually, currently I'm in Germany, a little bit north of Frankfurt in the countryside, but I spent most of my career in California, Silicon Valley, and the past seven years, we just moved here last year before seven years in Berlin. So, yeah. I was in Berlin recently for our convent, which is a huge sort of front of house spirits, beer and wine supplier. And so, um, yeah, I got to spend three days looking around Berlin and doing a bit of the sightseeing, you know, the classics, the Berlin Wall and various other bits and bobs. And we had a fantastic ambassador B out there who gave me firsthand accounts of what it was like during that period of time. An awesome, awesome city. I um, thoroughly enjoyed it. So. So talk to me a little bit about your background. You previously worked in, in California, working in the tech sector. So who was it you were working for and what sort of things were you doing? Yeah, so I spent most of my career in tech as a computer scientist. And yeah, I mean, that means, especially in California, that means high pressure environment, lots of deadlines, priorities, and also, the work mentality there is pretty much you work, work, work. <laughs> there is a little bit of sleep. So it's a high-pressure environment for sure. And I noticed, I mean, the first, I would say, five to ten years went very well. But over time, when you work in this high-pressure environment, you gradually notice symptoms of stress creeping in. And the body and mind are not in balance anymore because if you work 16 hours and the rest you basically recover somehow, it's not sustainable. And so I basically got into this whole stress trap about maybe 15 years ago and felt that I got less and less done. You know, didn't feel that well also. And all kind of stress symptoms came up. High blood pressure as an example brain fog mm. so it wasn't pleasant and then of course you try to cope somehow work harder to compensate but that was not going to do the trick and so yeah that was that when my journey started and i figured there has to be something i mean how do you do that i mean i like to do my work and it's a lot of fun working in this environment and uh, getting breakthroughs and really having an impact on 
people's life on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, especially, I mean, I worked at Yahoo. We had uh, five, 600 million users as an audience. That was quite significant. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of impact that you can generate, but how can you thrive in such an environment? That was the motivating question. And the reality was I had no clue at that point because I... <laughs> I was not trained to think about it in terms of, oh, there is something called awareness. Oh, there is something called the mind. And then there's the body. The body I knew there is. But going deeper into the mind and also understanding awareness as the primary driver, those were things that I had to uh, discover and explore over the past 10 to 15 years. And that got me eventually more and more deeper in all of these topics neuroscience, functional medicine, epigenetics, and so on. So that's how I gradually got more and more in here because I realized on the profound impact, if you know what to do on how to support your well-being, you can also become more yeah, prolific, productive, but you can do it in a sustainable way without crashing at some point. Massive. And I think that this, this is a topic that will massively resonate with our audience because we are constantly being asked in a similar way as, as you've just described to do more with less and to mm -hmm. do more with, there was a recent study by one of our stakeholders that showed that the rates of presenteeism and burnout had doubled since COVID. So we know as a community, as a society, we are experiencing that, those work-related stress impacts that you spoke about, such as physical and mental impacts and emotional impacts as well but that's the way it's always been done right and that's the cycle we stick ourselves in and unfortunately our brain has an incredible way and perhaps you can talk a little bit more on this is our brain has an incredible way of when we're really stressed or when we're really at our worst it tells you you're okay you can keep going just work a little bit harder start earlier finish later you know that's the best cure for this and that's completely that's an oxymoron right it's, it's the wrong way it's the wrong way to look at this yeah, yeah, but that's how it works. I mean, people, they say, oh, yeah, that's passing, that goes by, that's uh, everything is good. And they sometimes they feel reasonably well. They have no clue what's uh, happening under the hood in the meantime in the body, right? They have this ignorant view of things, in my opinion. They don't want to know actually what's happening there. They just, oh, yeah, I feel somehow I can compensate this little bit. But if you actually go down on a functional level, looking at the systems of the body, it's clearly that you're basically borrowing resources from the future that you don't have yet. And at some point it gets worse, right? And then when it really gets worse, then you notice more and more symptoms coming up. At some point you can't ignore anymore, right? So yeah. that's the point. And that process is not a fast process. It's a slow process that goes over many years. Right? And also some people tell me, oh, yeah, I go to the doctor every year and they do this comprehensive checkup. In reality, it's not comprehensive. <laughs> oh. They basically look at a few biomarkers. It's not many. And, of course, if something comes up there, then it's already way too late. <laughs> Those things are designed to really basically sick parameters. If they go up, that means you're already sick and then it's too late. But they're not testing health biomarkers. That's what you actually would need to do is testing your health. How good is my health? If you could represent it in a percentage from zero to 100, mm -hmm. but you want to know how good is my health index? And that's unfortunately not tested. And so you basically think from this one measurement once or every other year that you, oh yeah, my body is kind of okay right? And then you don't even think about, is that really true, right? It's not true. <laughs> and that's why this is a big problem is because most also medical practitioners, they also don't have all this updated new research and knowledge that they can actually look more comprehensively. But even if they would, a few of them have that knowledge, but even if they would, then we still have the problem with the whole insurance, health insurance, the way it operates. It's also not covered, right? And so people have to pay a lot of these lab di diagnostics out of pocket. And that's the big problem. And yeah, so it's, <laughs> I don't know, it's pretty bad. And I think it gets worse. 
But going back to the beginning of this, right, I think the importance here is really becoming more aware of your mind, becoming more aware of your body, so to also increase your body awareness. And that's why the first thing I discovered, this was this, there is this thing called awareness, right? And that was really the underlying, I would say, foundational pillar for doing all these upgrades on the mind, on the body, because with limited awareness, you're not even looking left or right, or right? you're just stuck with your thought activity, not reflecting, and you're literally trapped in your mind. And that is where most people, unfortunately, are, right? Mm. And, and some of them, obviously, there is some trend I've seen, and I would say in the past 10 years, that more and more people become aware of this. You've seen the whole industry of mindfulness. When I started looking into mindfulness, at that point, more motivated by reducing my own stress levels, I read about it. Oh, yeah, there's this thing called mindfulness. And my employer at that point, they offered a eight-week course on this, like a MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction course. And that's how I got the first time exposed to mindfulness. But what it really was, it was increasing your level of present awareness. I nowadays call it LPA, your LPA. And unfortunately, then you realize that your awareness level <laughs> at the beginning, especially when you start to measure it, since everything I do is based on data, data-driven, let's measure that stuff. Let's not make any assumptions. Let's look at it, how it really is, right? Awareness is low. That's the problem. And you can see that also in the whole, I mean, you see it also in attention span. You may have heard about that the average attention span nowadays is like seven seconds. It's yeah. like a goldfish, right? Mm. I think sometimes it's worse. And so that... <laughs> That is the problem we're dealing with, the whole generation now growing up. That's where the level of awareness is. It's relatively low. And there has to be some, in the beginning, at least a little bit of awareness to become aware of just that fact that you're so low in awareness and that you then become motivated. How can I increase awareness or how can I become more aware? Right? And that is the start of everything. And then when this awareness is in increasing, you become more aware of your mind. I call it the monkey mind, usually the untrained mm. state of mind where the thought activity is dominating. So lots of thoughts could be also a lot of negativity, worries about the futures and all that stuff. So this is the default state of mind. But if you become aware of that, you could literally become the observer of the mind. You can observe this and have a little bit more distance, but you can also observe your body. All of a sudden you can sense, oh, there's this aching here, right? You become more aware of it. Before that, you weren't even aware, right? And that helps you then to start some transformation if you want to change that. Of course, you can stick, stick to this as long as you like and get sicker and sicker over time. That's just the normal way it goes. And then there's this one thing called aging which works against you. <laughs> so yeah. things you could do early when you were in your, let's say in your twenties or early thirties, a lot of those things, you would just do them. You wouldn't even worry about them. Of course, the body has more resources, but then once you get into your forties or later fifties, then you, there's this decline. It's just happening. And it accelerates all the problems further, right? And so either, I always think if people are smart and recognize that that is the case, you think about, okay, what can I do in a proactive way to counterbalance and work, work against that aging, but also figure out what can I do to support my mind and body into a healthier state? And what at the end of the day, these interventions are or these daily routines or whatever is highly personalized. Mm -hmm. because we all have different preferences. We all need different things. We have different genes, right? And we're exposed to different environments. This is where epigenetics kicks in. And so what that at the end of the day is, it doesn't matter. At least if something is in your daily routine to support these things, so the most important part is, however, how do you measure all that stuff? And this is the KPIs, key performance indicators. 
the numbers, right? How do you know that you're actually healthy? How do you know your mind is actually in a calm state? How do you know your awareness is going up, not down? Like, show me the data. That is really when you when you start looking into the data, then you become aware of what's actually going on. I think it's amazing. I, I have so many questions and points. I'm also, I'm sure we're going to explore in more detail the, those KPIs, and we're going to look at actually how you measure something that is intangible in terms of you can't physically it's like an insurance policy right you know it's there but you you can't touch it or feel it it's nothing that's physical so i'm I'm very interested because we've done a lot of work ourselves into presenteeism based on psychometric testing but i guess one of the big questions that i have for you dr Rayner, is you and i have both started our journeys from the fact that we hit a down period with our health we've been impacted by not taking proactive steps and so we reacted and now we want to share that information to be able to help people be proactive. How can we change the thought process around that pro- proactive behavior, especially in a climate or society where, you know, perhaps the younger generation are used to dopamine hits and short three second videos and, and various other things, which is decreasing their attention span? You know, how do we get people to start to understand that actually this isn't a nice thing to do? Like if you perhaps if you're, you know, if you are feeling really poorly, then you should start taking vitamin C or then you should go for a walk and start exercising. How do we get people to start thinking about this from a more pragmatic and long term viewpoint? Yeah, that's a good question. I thought about that also a lot. I think it's usually, I think with limited awareness. So if your LPA, your level of present awareness is kind of low, the nature of humans is laziness, right? It's preserving energy. This is how our DNA evolved over thousands, hundreds, thousands of years, being lazy, right? And the only rescue there is increased awareness and start to really become aware of how you feel, become aware of your state of body and mind and start to ask questions. Hmm, is that normal that I have all these thoughts all the time, right? When I start to count these thoughts, let's say over a short meditation, all of a sudden I realize in three minutes I have more than 30 thoughts. Is that normal? Is it low? Is it high? Right? So you become aware of some things. Or if you realize that, yeah, I have this strange, my example before, this aching here going on every day, especially in the evenings. Is that normal? Right? What's going on? Right? Trying to, there's this curiosity at some point that gets triggered. If there is enough awareness, you become more curious. And I think that is the driver, is the curiosity when you just say, well, I'm here on this planet, I have this one shot, and what do I want to do with this time while I'm here, right? And then when you think about, very quickly, you you realize you can generate some value here or you can't, right? And if you want to generate some value, then the question usually then could be around, well, how can I maximize my contributions, And that leads to the answer. At the end of the day, you have to upgrade, right? You have to make sure that your body and your mind is in a really good high performance state so that you can get lots of stuff done. You can make a lot of significant contributions, but you can do that with an upgraded mind and upgraded body. And then, of course, the next question is, well, if that's the case as well, what do you do, right? How do you do it? But I think getting people to start in this direction is either it's happening or it's not. (laughs) Sometimes people get motivated when they see something tangible. They get curious and they get, uh, then this is when awareness kicks in, right? I give you an example. So on my side last year, I do usually once a year a measurement on my biological age. It's very precise test based on the DNA methylation. And when I did that last year, I was basically more than 10 years younger already than my actual age, right? And I kept, and and so when you're doing these things right, and when you know how to tweak the body and the mind, there's a lot of things you can do, especially in this whole field of longevity. But that was one thing. But then a few years ago, I always started 
to explore this idea I had already in the early when I was in the early 30s like early 30s mid 30s my hair turned gray the whole time gray hair and so I saw what and I thought it's a normal thing and um, later on I learned I would say in the past 10 years I learned more and more about it and so it's actually do because of increased stress levels and the body is not able to balance this anymore so there's a lot of free radicals happening there oxidative stress inflammation lack of resources minerals and at some point the body can't generate the color anymore right and that's when they turn gray and when i was in my 40s late 40s i mean it was almost white right white hair and so what the heck And then in the past few years, I figured, well, if the body is in good shape, it should be able to generate regular hair color, right? And so that's what I did. And so in the past three months, when I had my breakthroughs, all of a sudden, I'm back to my original color that I had when I was in my 20s, right? It's something visible. Of course, people know me or they look at Instagram and say, what the heck? Why is the hair color changing? What's going on? Did he color the hair now? What's <laughs> right? I said, I'm no. Just- I'm looking now at your website and all of your profile pictures, you've got like proper white, like silver hair. And yet we're on this podcast and your hair's brown. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so that is my point is that then when people saw this, right, some of them, they immediately pinged me and said, what's going on and how did you do that? And of course they wanted to see that if there is some quick fix, right? Is there, oh yeah, it's a quick fix. What's the deal, right? But there is unfortunately not a real quick fix. I think so thinking about the hair, however, motivated some people to all of a sudden start thinking about what can I do? And the first thing I told them, well, look, the color of your hair pretty much mirrors your overall health status. If your body is in good shape, has all the resources it needs, has not too many of these free radicals, low oxidative stress, and so on. The body can actually produce regular colored hair or even increase the number of hairs. When some people have uh, hair loss as well, that's a big deal. It's a similar thing. There is an imbalance in the body. Sometimes hormones also kick into this uh, or contribute to this as well. Mm-hmm. But at the end, it's all about imbalances. So it's not the body is not optimized. So and once you start optimizing the body, cool stuff happens. And so this is more like people want to, for instance, want to lose weight, right? When when I was back in these old days, 10, 15 years ago, I had more than 20 kilograms on extra weight that I was carrying around. And But I was not at that point going on to some fancy diet or any of these things. I just started once my knowledge about uh, functional medicine, epigenetics, and so in the past, I would say seven to 10 years gradually increased. I realized, well, this is just your metabolism needs to be hacked. And once you hack your metabolism, you also fix your mitochondria. So these are the little organelles in your cells. They usually are not doing very well (laughs) when you're in a state like this. And when you do these things, good stuff happens. So that means the weight loss, I lost then these 20 kilos of extra weight just happens on the side. Same thing like the hair, right? The hair turns into regular color. But it's just a side effect of what you're doing. It confirms that you're onto something, basically. So that's why these things, however, are good. They're visible. People can see them say, oh, you lost this weight. Or, oh, the the hair is now a different color. What did you do? This is when people get all of a sudden motivated. And that's a good thing. So that's why I uh, share those uh, breakthroughs. And I think maybe that is on my side a strategy to get people a little bit more motivated and some people then start actually taking a little bit of action. But yeah, I think the default state, unfortunately, is not proactive, it's reactive. It is what it is. And that's a challenge that we find. I think there's a better deal of self-awareness, especially with the younger generation as well. They're more sustainably minded. They're more sort of understanding that they are I say custodians, that your body is a, and brain is a machine and they are interlinked. And, and there's a lot more awareness than perhaps when I was at, at school, which is, you know, you do X, Y, and Z to keep your heart and your lungs strong, but your mental health, well, there isn't such a thing as mental health. The terminology or our understanding, our grasp of our brain and its functioning was not as great then. <laughs> but there's so many questions I have. So for our audience then, as a takeaway in, in terms of improving awareness, 
and not waiting until you're emotionally or mentally or even physically ill before you get your first sort of stab of awareness, whether that's through therapy or whether that's through your own personal journey. What tools or what techniques could you give to someone or just a suggestion that would allow them to begin their journey on becoming more self-aware? If you're enjoying this week's episode, consider heading over to our website and supporting our ongoing work in destigmatizing mental illness and creating a healthier, happier, and more sustainable industry by purchasing some of our branded merchandise. We have a whole range of t-shirts, hoodies, chef's jackets, well-being journals, plus a whole host more available on Worldwide Dispatch. All funds raised from sales of these items go towards free to access e-learning content as well as providing free support systems and help for those who may be experiencing difficulty with their mental health yeah so over the past years i asked myself exactly this question what is an effective way to increase bump up awareness and i developed a methodology which is called measurable mindfulness so it is a, adding a dimension of data to mindfulness. Otherwise, for me, this was all not a little bit, it was too fluffy, not tangible enough. So I do a little bit of, as an example, a little bit of mindfulness exercises, some meditation, maybe whatever. But I couldn't really then tell myself, well, is this, it feels good, but is it really helping? Is my awareness level actually increasing or not? What's happening here? <laughs> it could be... Give me some data. And so that's why I developed this methodology, measurable mindfulness. And it's actually quite easy and it works very well for people who like data, who are actually curious. They like data to track progress. And that is, and I would say in my industry, I worked in, in tech, data was key, right? Everything was based on data. When you develop products, services, whatever, everything was based on data and it works in the business world. Because if you don't know where you're going, especially in business, and you don't know your numbers, it's not a good sign, right? And yeah. you would get, especially, it doesn't matter where, right? If you don't know your numbers, eventually you're not going to be successful. And here it's the same thing. So becoming the CEO of your own health, that the terminology sometimes people talk about, taking over this ownership, really, and for mindfulness or for then. Mindfulness, you can think about as a methodology in general to increase in awareness level, because if you're fully aware and you don't have to sit in meditation all day, you can be fully aware as an example, as we're talking now, I can be fully aware of what's going on here in this context. I'm still aware of noises here in this room. I can look here outside in the countryside. There's this big window in front of me where I can see there's a cat uh, hopping around in the meadows there and I don't know, maybe wants to catch some mice, who knows. So fully aware of all that stuff and that can be done. Typical awareness exercises can be integrated in your daily life. There's no magic here. It's very simple stuff you do anyway, but you do it more aware. Mm. You need to add the dimension of tracking. So this is what I'm suggesting. Let's track this stuff. So that at the end of the day, when the day is over and you reflect in the evening, you could answer the question, how many, for instance, mindful minutes did I accumulate today? So how many minutes were you fully present, fully connected to the present moment? This is a mindful minute, basic unit. How many can you accumulate? And if you have the tracking in place, some of the tracking can be done here with some smartphone apps. There is here this Ura ring, for instance, that helps me keep track of a lot of data from my body, but also mm -hmm. mindful minutes can also be tracked here. Not all of them, but many of them. And this is how you do it. You start tracking and you figure out ways on how to simplify the tracking, how to make the tracking more effective. And then how can you integrate more of those mindful moments over your day and usually when I start working with clients, I have this training, high performance mind when people do going through this in four months. And when they start, usually establish a baseline on awareness for their level of present awareness, that LPA is usually about 2%. So that means 2% of the day, sometimes 3%. This is 
when you're fully present and connected to the present moment. So two to three percent. And what does this mean? Well, these are about 20, 30 mindful minutes. If you basically accumulate these mindful minutes, 16 hours wake time. So this is roughly a thousand minutes. So you can see if you divide them up, mindful minutes by the whole minutes, you're fully awake as a percentage. So then you're at two to three percent. And this is where you start. And then I usually challenge people and say, look, can you ramp that up, get boosted to 5%, maybe more, right? Later to 10%. And by the end of these four months, usually I want to have them settled in like 15, 20% range. And the magic happens usually when the awareness goes more than 6 7%. This is when you start, they see breakthroughs happening in their life just as a side effect, right? <laughs> That's why you don't have to do anything special. You just work on awareness and the magic happens once you reach maybe six, 7% or more. And then the challenge is to operationalize this in the training to keep this level of present awareness at, let's say, more than 15%, 20% as a challenge. And that is a challenge because the days are different. We have maybe regular work days, then we're on a business trip or then we're whatever, then we have vacations. So there, the cha- there's always constant change going on in our daily activities usually. And the challenge is then to operationalize these methods, these routines in a way that they work context independent so that you can stabilize your LPA with maybe 10%, 15% on average until it becomes completely automated. That is the challenge. And this is when the transformation happens because then automatically as a next step, you become more aware of the mind and then you (laughs) become aware of all those faulty routines in your mind, limiting thoughts, reactive patterns, all that garbage. And then you wonder how can you upgrade them? Well, this is also done in the training. It's called mind management, upgrade the mind software. And then in parallel, usually people start also working then on the body, fix the body, give the body more resources in forms of the relevant minerals, fatty acids, lipids, amino acids, uh, proteins, and so on, right? So this is happening then gradually. And then this high performance mind concept, what I'm talking about is just a lifestyle where you put these things together that works for you. And then all the good stuff happens as a side effect. I love this. So for context, having experienced my own deep dive into biology and psychology and and tested myself as a bit of a guinea pig really on this subject matter, I would say that my self-awareness over the last six years has grown tremendously to the point now where, you know, if you're in a shop and you're looking at a particular food choice, you go, what is driving that behavior? Is that the right fuel? Is that the right thing for me at this moment in time? And making a conscious decision to divert yourself away from that impulsive drive, that quick reality, that quick fulfillment. So I'm really, yeah, really, really engaging. I love this whole thought process. The interesting thing for me is how you measure this, because as a result of being more open-minded and more aware, I would say now serendipity follows me. I use the term serendipity follows me around like a bad smell. Things happen in my life that I have no rhyme or reason for, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but they always happen. There's always a reason that I can attribute to them. Or I might meet someone that I've been trying to get hold of for six months randomly in a lift in in London. You know, there was no predetermined set point. So if we're talking about awareness and we're talking about sort of biohacking and looking at how we increase awareness and how we measure the performance and impact that has. How have you developed or what have you developed in order to be able to start to track that and how do people go about doing so? Yeah, so the tracking is something they need to learn. That's why it's a training. There is knowledge to absorb on the tracking. I mean, you have to know, first of all, what do you need to track? How do you track it? It has to fit into your lifestyle. You also have to then figure out how to establish a baseline. You also have to learn what type of interventions can be used to have an impact on that KPI. Mm -hmm. And then you have to keep measuring at some point. It also depends. Some of these things you can measure daily, some weekly, monthly. 
as an example, a very good body KPI is your heart rate variability and hacking that heart rate variability, which will be measured, by the way, again, with the ring here. Ura ring is probably the best source for measuring HRV in terms of precision and convenience because it does this overnight. So there is no extra work needed. You just wake up in the morning, you know what your HRV is. <laughs> and if it's low, that means, unfortunately for many, it is like this. It's low, that means it's not good. Mm -hmm. As the body is not in good shape, it needs to this this whole keeping everything in balance, the parasympathic, sympathetic nervous system, right? keeping this balance is a work for the body. And usually if you're under a lot of stress, HRV goes down as a result of this because the compensation is not happening that properly anymore. And so the tracking here is relatively easy. But you see, that is one example for one KPI that is not easy to optimize. You have to first really put in a, is a steep learning curve. Also, how to measure it. You can do, it's a very sensitive measurement, by the, by the way. Uh, there are so many different ways on measuring it, and many of them are very fragile. And so you have to really learn all that stuff. And that's why people don't have time for that, right? So that's why I created this training. Uh, the motivation was because they asked me, how can you get that done quickly? Quickly means now, and of course, I told them now is not possible, but if you spend a few months, if three or four months, then we can get some results done, right? And that's what they learn is, so there is, without training, it's not doable. You have to learn. And of course, you can seek out all those resources. Nowadays, there's so many resources out there on the internet, books, and so on. But that's a significant investment of time and there's a lot of trial and error, right? Since you probably, as you also work on these optimizations for yourself, what I heard, right? You know how it is. There's a lot of the stuff you're trying out is not going to work, right? And so that can be a random process. For me, it took like 15 years <laughs> to get okay. here. And that's why I said this has to be more efficient. And so that's why training is the key thing. You need to learn this knowledge, you need to experiment and operationalize it, right? And that's why a training approach is perfect for this. And of course, uh, then some people, uh, they like to have more support. They want some coaching, mentoring or whatever. So there is more support can be provided, right? But usually it's a, I would say it's a lightweight learning process and the focus is more on then experimenting and figuring out how to integrate this data layer in your life yeah. so that it actually works. It won't be perfect. And it's also not there forever. So some of the tracking at some point you can uh, remove again, right? Like let's say tracking mindful minutes. Usually I don't do that anymore. Like once you reach a high level of an LPA, which is stable, you don't have to do that anymore. So it's not needed because you are by default, that aware, right? And you become aware at that point immediately when you go back into old patterns <laughs> yeah. and then you can make a shift. But at the beginning, it's recommended to track it unless you stabilize your LPA in 15, 20% range. This is what you need. And then there is some manual tracking involved. So there is no free lunch here. So you have to spend some effort to track that. It's not that complicated, it's doable, it's not a lot of work, but it requires willpower and it requires basic awareness. That's why without basic awareness, you can't even work on that. It's not going to happen. So moving forward then is, as part of your work, I mean, I've scoured through your website and can I just say for the audience, Dr. Rayner is an incredibly inspiring individual, not just because of the fact that he's, you know, talking about this particular subject matter but i think was it 120 us patents you have at the moment or it might even be more since that bio was written and mit technology review also nominated you as a top innovator under 30 so this isn't just general conversation here this is evidence data science backed real lived life on something that actually is is creating massive massive impact massive impact so I guess moving this conversation forward a bit is in terms of a high performance mind. And, you know, we've moved past that awareness stage. People have a, a basic understanding of awareness. They've managed to reach a certain threshold of 15 to 20%. 
in terms of maximizing performance and the sort of things that people will see, what are sort of your key standouts for that? And what would you do with your clients in terms of being able to maximize that performance? Yeah, it depends. So the breakthroughs that they're achieving, they are different. So depending on what some of their focus areas are, right? some people, for instance, they struggle with staying focused as an example, or many of them lack energy. Just getting out of bed in the morning is can be a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so there are breakthroughs then that are really dependent on what the current situation is where they are struggling, where they put energy in. But then the breakthroughs are happen normally, right? So they happen on the mind side. So you could see that on one side, there's breakthroughs on the mind. Usually people become more calm, peaceful, less stressed, right? So typical side effects there, the negativity, self-confidence goes up. So you can observe and of course, you can measure all that stuff, mind KPIs. So this is when uh, for mind management, like upgrading the mind OS, mind operating system or the mind software, yeah. there's also about 10 different KPIs on how to track that. And you can then see an impact there on those KPIs, how the mind gets better and better. And of course, cognitive abilities, emotional intelligence, all the good stuff is skyrocketing <laughs> when you're doing it properly. And you'll notice that, or not just you notice it, other people will notice it with you. Yeah. So they, they come to you and they, they ask, what's going on? They notice, they sense that there is an increased presence. People sense that. And then they also notice when you, when the behavior shifts. Right, based on the mind upgrades and the body. Yeah, I mean, those are visible things as well, right? When depending on your situation, people notice when you all of a sudden have more energy, feel right, they sense that there's something happening there. And of course, if the body changes, right, like in my case, all of a sudden the hair color is different, uh, what's going on, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> yeah. Right. Or like in the past few weeks, I focused on not two weeks, a few weeks, about two months. I focused also on the skin, basically improving the skin and also on blood pressure optimizations. And so some of these things, they are visible to others. Some of them, you can see them at the biomarker level, like when all of a sudden blood pressure goes down by 10 points. You can see that. And some of them, you, it's not immediately that you feel them. So I couldn't say that I would feel that my blood pressure is now much better, right? Because some of these things are subtle. And that's why mm. some of these things are also so dangerous because they're lurking there. You may have, for instance, high blood pressure. And I would say the, the so far what data I've seen, the majority of people have this problem of what's called a metabolic syndrome. And so there's all these cardiovascular conditions. Hypertension is obviously one of them. And some of them are not that visible first, but you can, once you start actually figure out that they are there, and once you start actually working towards improving them, some of them have, have a visible impact, like the hair color is an example, or the skin. All of a sudden you look 20 years younger. Yeah, that's visible. But if other important, let's say, inflammation markers are going down or like oxidative stress goes down, as an example, blood pressure regularizes and stabilizes in a healthy range. Those are things others may not see, but you measure them and you have validation that this is actually happening, right? So I would say a lot of good stuff. <laughs> what it is depends on yourself, but you don't want to go back once you have them, right? You don't want to go back then prior to this time. Once you get used to a high performance mind, life is different and you don't want to go back in this old state, which is the default state for unfortunately most of us. Because once you realize what the potential is and once you're working on this new potential from this, right, when everything is upgraded, it's the same like maybe a simple comparison would be if you buy a new fancy mattress and all of a sudden you sleep that well, right? And then someone tells you, okay, now let's get rid of this mattress. Let's go back to this old one that you had, where you had all these back aches and pains and all this stuff, go back to that. You would say, are you crazy? I wouldn't go back to this old mattress. <laughs> I wanna, 
I want to keep yeah. it. And this is where awareness keeps you. Awareness keeps you when things sliding back into old patterns. Mm. You quickly become aware that you're doing the wrong things again or not doing anything that could be beneficial to keep these levels. And then you can, with this awareness, you can every day is a new opportunity then to make these changes again that are helpful and get you to where you want to go. That mattress analogy really works for me because <laughs> I was sleeping terribly, mainly because of workplace and life pressures, but also because our mattress was proper old. And so I replaced our mattress recently and I have had the best night's sleep um, I've had for months. And you're right. If someone offered me that old mattress back, I'd be like, <laughs> no chance. Yeah, that, exactly. That's really how it is, right? Once you reach a state of a high performance mind, if your mind is upgraded, the body is upgraded, and then you look back, it depends. I mean, this is a lifestyle. Well, I said high performance mind is a lifestyle. Once you get going, You'll see breakthroughs rel relatively quickly, but let's say you're doing this for a year or two. Usually more than a year is important because that is sufficient level of time to basically regenerate and upgrade all of your cells in the body. That's how long it takes, right? So, but then the whole body is basically upgraded. Every cell basically is upgraded. It's the new you, right? That's why I use this analogy, the new you. So my Instagram account, the new you.de. When I'm talking about this, there's this continuous process of the body where the cells are being replaced and upgraded, and it takes time. Some cells, they upgrade themselves faster, but in general, it takes a year. And so if you're doing this for a year or longer, this is when you feel substantial difference to before, and you wouldn't want to go back to the old mattress, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but you have no idea. The problem is you have no idea how that would look like in your scenario, what is even possible, right? Because you take the current status quo, you think this is, and it it's might be pretty good, right? You're happy with the current status quo, yeah. but if you actually become or do the high performance mind lifestyle and you do this for a year and everything is upgraded, then you see, oh my goodness, right? It's a game changer basically. Yeah, I could probably talk to you for hours, hours more, but I appreciate it. sort of you're an incredibly busy man. And so I don't want to take up a great deal of time. But I think if anyone who is listening to this currently and, and trying to gain sort of, sort of concept, I think from personal experience, you know, having been probably one of the most negative people that you could ever meet, you know, I was a natural pessimist, everything was doom and gloom. And, you know, you can guarantee that if I walked out the front door, I would get splashed by the next car that came past because that was just my lot in life. But becoming more aware and, and seeing the impact that that's had on perspective, there to be no barriers. And I think that's probably one of the most interesting things for me is there are no limitations now. There might be physical limitations in terms of strength, or there might be you know, resilience limitations. But now when someone says, you can't do that, or that's not possible, I look for ways that you can. And knowing that you can achieve things and you can take the next step, even if you don't know what that step is or the answers or even have the knowledge on how to do that, that should not stop you from achieving something else whether that is just getting in shape whether that's starting a new hobby or a career or building a business or being a better you know family family person just because you don't have the answers doesn't mean that it's not possible and that that potential is limitless and i think that that's ultimately where we're both coming from isn't it really it's mm -hmm. that once you realize that potential you look back and go Firstly, I don't want to go back to where I was. And secondly, what else is around the corner if I keep going on this journey? Like, how else can I improve? What else can I do next? Yeah, um, that's exactly it. There's always a little bit more. But of course, you can, at some point, you can stay in a very comfortable space, right? If the mind and body have a certain upgrade level, a sufficient awareness level, of course, you can stay in there. There's no need to do more, but usually... I know many people in this in this whole biohacking space, they're always looking to get even then a little more. And why not, right? So looking at your bio and looking at the sort of work and, and the incredible, incredible impacts that you've made in research and development over the last sort of 50 years or so, what would you say is next on the horizon for you? I mean, I know that you're spending a lot of time in terms of developing people and, and creating more awareness around this particular subject matter and helping people develop and improve. 
But as a human being, as a human race, I sense that you're probably not the sort of person who would just be comfortable just sitting and plodding along. What's next? Like, where do you see the potential or where do you see that perhaps we are not quite ready for? What's around the corner? I'm so interested to find out from your perspective. Yeah, well, I think for now, and I would say the past five years when I founded The Mindful Leader, I did a lot of yeah experimentation work and figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and so on. I created these trainings, and last year I opened here my own epigenetic lab here in the countryside, and I started to create on one side this mentoring program where I work with Many of my clients are either they are executives, entrepreneur, but also health practitioners or even medical doctors mm. when they're trying to take advantage of this new knowledge, right, and work with them. And that is currently my focus to help other people to tap into this new knowledge. But I also want to do it in a scalable way. So I created, for instance, a Mind Master Academy where coaches primarily can use this methodology to help that with their clients, right? Because that is a big issue. If you're a coach, as an example, <laughs> you have all these good impulses, but uh, the client is, is not implementing somehow them because of their own monkey mind. So, <laughs> so you have to figure out how can you help more and scale. And I think that scaling part is currently for me on the horizon in the next years, figure out how to scale this better, help more. And who knows what comes next this is all evolving at that point. And I'm also still learning a lot. I spent quite some time on workshops, retreats, uh, seminars, and getting even deeper into these topics uh, because it feels like the knowledge is just exploding and yeah. You want to take advantage of the latest and greatest here. Definitely. I'm intrigued. I'm already going to talk more about your services, et cetera, or offline. I think there's, there's a lot in there that would be quite interesting. I'd love to come and meet you and, and spend a bit of time sort of seeing what you do on a day-to-day -day basis as well. But I guess there's any key takeaways for our audience. Is there anything that you wanted to a, leave with them or where you could where you could find out more before we close up this podcast episode? Yeah, I think if the listeners here, if the awareness was there and became aware, use this awareness, this little glimpse of awareness that tells you, oh, there is more to life than just work. <laughs> mm. uh, it's also about taking proper care of yourself. And that means mind and body. And if that impulse today came through that oh yeah let's do something there that is a good thing and there are so many ways on how to bump up awareness maybe it's taking a medication local meditation class as an example which is convenient fits into your schedule right and on my site the mindfulleader.net or epigeneticpraxis.de i'll will share probably those links as part of the show notes is where you can find me and my work and yeah i think the motto is becoming a little bit more aware every day yeah certainly definitely and honestly i've got so much more to talk to you about but i appreciate it. you know we've got to keep these clear and concise otherwise they end up in you know four hour long episodes and people uh i don't know i don't know if you are interested in four hour long episodes then give me a shout <laughs> we'll, start, <laughs> we'll start deep diving into epigenetics and biohacking in more detail and other subject matters but dr rena thank you ever so much for joining us and i found this absolutely fascinating and, and if anyone is interested in learning more head to the mindfulleader.net where you'll be able to find dr rena's bio history services and you have your own podcast as well i believe yeah i have also my own podcast the mindful leader podcast nice yeah so check that out as well thank you ever so much thanks yeah cheers <laughs>